Uh, my name is Dennis Compton. Uh, I'm going to be your moderator for this session today. Uh, I was with the Phoenix Fire Department in Arizona for 28 years, assistant chief there for a long time. I was a fire chief then in Mesa, Arizona for six more years. Uh, and since that time, I, I have been the chairman of IFSTA, the International Fire Service Training Association. I work a lot with the Congressional Fire Services Institute, and I'm the chairman of the board of directors of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Okay, and we're really glad to have you with us today. We have a great panel for you today. And what I'm going to do here is introduce the panel, then I'm going to get out of the way. They'll do their presentations, and, uh, and there'll be an opportunity for questions as well throughout the session, okay? Any questions for me before we get started? <clears throat> Nationally recognized for his work in the field of behavioral health, Dr. Paul Reagan has more than 30 years of experience as a psychiatrist and medical researcher specializing in alcohol and substance abuse treatment and recovery. Dr. Reagan previously served as the medical director for Vanderbilt Medical Center's Employee Assistance Program, and his career also includes positions as the director of Tennessee Valley Health System Substance Abuse Treatment Program for Veterans, uh, a consultant at the National Naval Medical Center, and senior psychiatrist for the, for the second medical battalion of the United States Marine Corps during Operation Desert Storm. As the medical director of New Life Lodge, he designs and oversees evidence-based programs that offer patients access to the most recent advancements in addiction treatment. Dr. Reagan continues to contribute as an associate professor at Vanderbilt University and senior consulting psychiatrist at, at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Our second panelist is Dr. Claire Camerata, and uh, Claire is, a, is uh, the clinical director for the FDNY Counseling Service Unit. Uh, she is also an adjunct lecturer at the New York University Silver School of Social Work. Uh, Dr. Camerata offers uh, psychotherapy practice serving adolescents and adults specializing in trauma work, grief, and bereavement issues and addictions. Her areas of research have included post-traumatic growth and behavioral health programs for emergency service workers. Her publications uh, have appeared in the American Journal of Public Health and others as well. Uh, she has several professional affiliations, including the National Association of Social Workers and the New York City Task Force on Suicide Prevention and the Women's Mental Health Consortium in New York City. And finally, uh, Dan DeGrace. Dan is a 24-year firefighter with the Chicago Fire Department, 18 years of which as an officer. Uh, he presently holds the rank of Captain EMT. He's a certified employee assistance professional, a certified alcohol and drug abuse counselor, a certified labor assistance professional, and has advanced training in critical incident stress management. Uh, Dan was able to apply his CISM training as peer support at, 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 in New York post 9-11 and in Chicago following the E2 nightclub disaster. He has been a member of the International Association of Firefighters Labor EAP Committee since 2002. And with that, would you please help me welcome our panelists, and Dr. Reagan, you will kick this off for us. Thank you. Yeah, we're starting now. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the, uh, the invitation to, uh, uh, to speak with you uh, this morning. Uh, in about the next 20, 20 minutes or less, I want to uh, cover as much uh, of the waterfront as I can. Uh, my disclosures. Uh, the, uh, it was interesting because I was talking with Dennis. Uh, I went to uh, high school, probably one of my more important uh, credentials, at uh, Tempe, Arizona, right next to uh, Mesa. And so the Phoenix area is very near and dear to me. Uh, the United States Navy paid for medical school, so uh, then I did my payback. It tends to work that sort of way. The reason I'm showing this is this is the National Naval Medical Center, uh, which has now been combined with Walter Reed. 
And I want you to take a look at this building right here. Uh, that's the uh, uh, building one, and uh, that was designed uh, by FDR, uh, pattern, patterned after the Omaha State Legislature, uh, State Capitol building. Uh, that was a hospital, and uh, uh, there were wards there, and if you can imagine uh, uh, the rounds going up and down. Uh, one of the problems is that the VIP suite, uh, it's, it's now over here, but the VIP suite's up there. In 1949, the Secretary of War, as it was called in those days, now Secretary of Defense, Forrestal, uh, was very depressed. He was admitted here for treatment, and uh, people let their guard down, and he jumped and landed on the uh, roof of the third floor. So I trained uh, for four years uh, with the shadow of uh, Secretary Forrestal, and that was well known to all of us in the psychiatry training program, uh, his, his death uh, from, from jumping and, and depressed. It's also an example of VIP syndrome. Uh, when I was chief resident, I admitted, uh, obviously not there, uh, I admitted a United States senator to our, our ward who had depression. Um, the, uh, so it, it's something that uh, never goes away. Uh, I was in Desert Storm and actually uh, on the desert floor evaluated a number of people who were suicidal. Uh, went back to Bethesda Naval uh, uh, Center as, uh, as the, the director of the uh, outpatient uh, psychiatry uh, uh, clinics service. And one of the things I had on my uh, desk was a bat phone, which uh, was a direct line from Congress, uh, the, the physician to Congress, who was a rare admiral, uh, and was a, uh, that was part of our you know, prevention program. Uh, one of the things that's important in terms of uh, suicide is uh, prior to working at uh, New Life Lodge as the medical director, uh, I was uh, 15 years at uh, full-time at Vanderbilt and uh, director of the uh, psych consult service and we saw lots and lots of uh, suicide attempts, some of whom uh, survived and some did not. It's, Vanderbilt now is about over a thousand beds, the only level one trauma center in a 65,000 square mile area, regional burn center, um, etc. One of the things that, uh, because of my occupational psychiatry experience in the Navy, that I was tapped to do uh, with Vanderbilt is I'm the medical director of the employee assistance program there. And when I started there, we only saw about eight to 10 physicians a year. And if you want a, a group uh, that's very difficult to get in, to, uh, a group of uh, people that are very hard to get in and get them to ask for help, um, and, uh, and actually uh, receive help, it's, it's physicians. Uh, what, uh, in 98, we had several physician deaths and through the leadership at Vanderbilt, we uh, ex vastly expanded and started the faculty and physician wellness program. We have a nursing uh, program. And so we went from seeing eight to 10 physicians a year who were basically exit interviews, uh, end stage uh, uh, addiction, totally impaired, to last year we saw 288. And over about 92% of those were uh, self-referrals and, uh, and a minority of them had uh, substance abuse problems. They were coming in for a wide variety. So I think that's really important in terms of a model for some of the things that uh, you want to do with EAPs in, in uh, the fire service. Uh, I think that uh, at the conclusion of today's workshop, with the information that uh, Dan and Claire will be giving you, that this is not an overly uh, ambitious objective. To be able to recognize when someone may be struggling with suicidal thoughts or intentions and then get them to the right per place and person for an evaluation. A couple simple facts about suicide. I'm going to show you some statistics. Suicide is common. On planet Earth, a little over 7 billion people, approximately 1 million people kill themselves. Verified suicide per year that we know of. Uh, 
one of the things that uh, is so interesting is people have been killing themselves for a long, long time, but the word suicide did not enter the English language until 1643. So uh, that's Think about it, that's after Shakespeare had written his entire canon. That's after King James Version of the Bible. So our language was pretty well formed by then, but it wasn't until that year. Uh, people who, uh, one of the things, obviously, that the message is, people who are seriously thinking about suicide, planning suicide, or have attempted, can be evaluated and they can be treated. And uh, it's a way to save lots of lives. Suicide is common. This is the rate in the United States. For, uh, for many years, up to 2,000 it went down, and now, unfortunately, it is slowly uh, climbing back. And these rates are per 100,000, which is how suicide is usually expressed. Uh, this uh, is a difficult slide to see, but what's important is, is that uh, the United States uh, is not especially high in suicide rates compared to Korea, Hungary, Japan, Finland. Uh, and uh, one of your colleagues had asked about uh, the, the, the smaller numbers here are uh, uh, the uh, uh, women. In the United States, it's about four men to every one woman. Interestingly, uh, in China, uh, there are more women suicides than, than, uh, than males. So some of these things don't always hold true. One of the things that's important about having this conference in Colorado is we have a suicide belt in the United States, and it's in the West, uh, with, the, uh, with those of us, in, in, uh, a couple of us in the South, uh, uh, trying to catch up. But it, it is really a Western United States phenomenon, and, and that's partly uh, uh, considered to be due to population density. So if you look at Alaska, it's you know huge, huge land mass, small, um, fairly small population. So uh, I think that's one of the, the most important. This is a summary slide that I'd like you to see uh, that I'll show you at the very end again. Uh, the male versus female. Uh, suicide in this country is predominantly in terms of ethnicity is a Caucasian phenomenon and a Native American phenomenon. The, the rest of the groups are, are relatively low. And then what's important, um, and so I want you to think of this, and then I want you also to think of what is the basic demographic of professional firefighters in the United States and Canada. And then uh, this is the age grouping, and it, and it peaks around 45 to 59. Um, I'm, I'm uh, 58 myself, so I'm hoping to get out of that peak soon. One of the things that's important in this country is to why it's so much higher in, uh, in men than in women. And I just uh, threw this slide in because I wanted to show you. Uh, it, it's, uh, it didn't blow up very well. But a large survey of middle school and high school students, when they feel, have lots of negative feelings, uh, do, how often do they go get help? And the blue in the middle are the males, and the light on the right are the females. And which group, and so the females will go for help more often than the men in all, in all categories, and except for don't want, don't need help. So there's something about the way we're, males are enculturated in this society that they do not feel like they have permission to, uh, to ask for help. One of the things that's very near and dear to my heart, having served in the uh, United States Navy for 10 years and served with the Marine tw Marines twice, is the rate of suicide uh, in the military. And uh, again, th th this didn't blow up well, as well as I would have liked. The, the, this, uh, the, actually, the next one just is better. Um, I can get rid of that slide. One of the things to look at is that the Marine Corps had a big peak, and, and these are the vet, active duty personnel, many of whom have served overseas, obviously. The Marines had a big peak. The Air Force and the Navy have pretty much stayed the same, and it's really the Army 
that has uh, continued, and this is rate per 100,000. So the national average of, all, of the entire United States is about 12. So the Army is about 24 and, and ha remains as of 2011 and, 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 and 12, it's not shown on here, the Army remains with a very high, amongst active duty personnel, with a very high suicide rate. One of the things that's really important to understand is of the 30 to 40,000 people who commit suicide in the United States every year, that's really very difficult on a prospective level to be able to assess that because uh, the, uh, some surveys have shown, for example, almost 9 million adults have serious thoughts. So not everyone who has a serious thought obviously goes on to commit suicide. Two and a half million have made plans. Uh, a million have attempted, and yet in this context, when you see how prevalent suicidal thoughts, plans, and attempts are, you can see that only, the fact that only 36 to 38,000 kill themselves in some ways is miraculous. But really you need to understand that suicide occurs in this pretty large spectrum. That didn't come out as well. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, to give you a taste of uh, uh, what you'll hear in a few minutes, is how to think about suicide. It is a negative, the, the person experiencing these thoughts, intentions, and plans is experiencing a lot of negative emotion. They feel hopeless about the future. They feel so overwhelmed with their negative feelings, they, don't, they feel helpless, that they're not going to be able to, to do anything. It's not going to get better, they're not going to be able to do anything, and, they, and, and feelings of worthlessness. You, you're hearing that kind of music from someone, that triad's a big one. That's, that's probably more predictive than anything else that we have in our arsenal. The other three things you want to think of is mood disorder, depression, any number of things like that, substance abuse, and the thought disorder. By thought disorder, somebody who is maybe is a, um, using substances and is not thinking as clearly. And then last but not least, we look at low rescue scenarios, high rescue scenarios, and lethality of means. In every category of having thoughts, made plans, attempted, those with drug and alcohol have higher, uh, higher rates. Precipitating factors, not just what, the things I talked about, but problems in physical health, crisis, uh, intimate partner, loss of a relationship is a really, really big one. Lethality of means, uh, I can't believe, but I was on CNN once, doctor, why do so many people jump in Manhattan? Because there's a lot of tall buildings. Because there's means available. Uh, Secretary Forrestal had a means. Um, one of the highest suicide rates is on a Cornell campus. I've never visited, but I'm told between the uh, dorms and the classrooms is a huge gorge. What's the most common form of suicide at Cornell? Jumping. If somebody has weapons at home. How, so always think of not, uh, that, that someone has means. I got very interested in depression and diabetics who are insulin dependent because when they're depressed, they have the means. You can't take those, the means away from them. Uh, percentage of total suicides by method. Interestingly, uh, this is uh, uh, over 50% uh, in uh, the U.S. versus uh, uh, Canada. However, the rates of suicide still remain very similar in both countries. Uh, one of the other things that was, uh, I'd uh, gotten uh, out of the Navy when the Chief of Naval Operations committed suicide. And this gives you kind of a taste for how something like th this can happen. Uh, he uh, was the only Chief of Naval Operations who never went to high school, joined the Navy when he was 16, never went to the academy, uh, uh, was, was, so good, was su such a good enlisted performer that he went to officer candidate school and made it all the way from E1 
to the top admiral in the Navy. And he had a lot of stress, but uh, Newsweek was after him, and they said that he was we uh, wearing V for valor on one of his medals that he wasn't entitled to. Uh, I've seen lots of Vietnam vets. When you came out of Vietnam, if that clerk, I have a DD-214, it says on there, a clerk typed up the medals I'm allowed to wear. If the clerk makes a mistake, it was brought to Admiral Borda's attention the year before, and he took it off. He took off the V. Okay, if I'm not entitled, to, I mean, he had Legion of Merit. He, he, he had a lot of medals. But this public humiliation was such that at the time he's supposed to meet with the Newsweek reporters, he shot himself with a gun someone had given him for self-protection. Mindy McCready, anybody ever hear of Mindy McCready? Uh, being from Nashville, um, uh, and she uh, uh, killed herself after the loss of a loved one. She battled. I helped take care of Mindy McCready right towards the end of her career uh, and suffered horribly from uh, uh, addiction uh, with the help of actually no less than Dr. Fail, we got her into treatment because she didn't have the money rehab for 28 days but she didn't follow through and then years later uh, tragic results. Male veterans in general, not just recent veterans, have uh, much higher rates of suicide in, in uh, uh, several age groups but again in the young and 35 to 44, 45 to 54. Uh, suicide amongst vets is more common uh, with uh, firearms, males, Caucasians, and in the Army. Uh, the military suicides that, that have gotten a lot of attention, uh, it's important to put it in a context, and you can see in the 80s it was much higher. And again, much like the rest of the country went down, and much like the rest of the country it's going up. So the significance of this is not as clear except that it remains high in the armies, and that's statistically significant. So right now, once a day, a veteran, uh, I mean a, an active duty person kills himself. Suicide amongst firefighters. That's what I want you to, be, to, to think about. Why is it important? One of the things is the effects of not, not just the impact of trauma, uh, and acute and chronic stress, but trauma is cumulative. So if you had childhood trauma that was unaddressed and then more uh, trauma as a child. L last area and we'll wrap up. Firefighters experience a number of factors that place them at risk for suicide. Physical uh, uh, illness, injury, on the job injury, substance abuse, if there's a drinking culture. I know a lot about drinking culture. I went to Dartmouth College. Everybody drank. I was in the Navy. Everybody drank. Uh, and both those organizations are trying to turn that drinking culture around. Depression and trauma exposure. Uh, the effects of psychological trauma are cumulative. That's the, one of the most important things. Just like repeated head trauma is cumulative, and somebody like Troy Aiken after 10 concussions has got to get out of the NFL. One of the things is if you don't get help for psychological trauma and you're sitting on years and years of it, it's going to be it's going to weigh on you and be a risk factor. Who, uh, this is the least gruesome, this is not gruesome at all. There are lots of gruesome pictures out there of what you guys have to do. Uh, so amongst North Carolina firefighters, uh, here are some actual statistics that, that show suicides occurred more than three times as often as line of duty deaths. Uh, out of our brethren in Arizona that, uh, uh, are no longer with us, uh, and this reminds me of Hudson, my Dalmatian that I had for 12 and a half years. Uh, we have looked at the suicide rates amongst military men in uniform, and what I want you to do is try to understand suicide in other uniform services, uh, and especially amongst professional firefighters. Again, the demographics are such that before you even get out of the box, Male, Caucasian, age group. It's something that uh, is important uh, given your line of work that you pay attention to. And then uh, let me end there. Thank you. Do you, you want to do any questions now or later? Yes, sir.
Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, I think we beat the over-under. I figured that there would probably be about 15 people that were here. Um, it's good to see a, a good group of people here, or maybe your flights are not leaving until tomorrow. Um, actually, I hope that the reason that everybody's here is because you really want to learn about what's going on in the fire service about suicide. Obviously, it, in my realm, it's the buzz. Everybody's talking about it. But it's kind of like the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s with substance abuse. Are we really talking about it? Hopefully, from this presentation, what we're going to be able to do is give you some tools. Now, I've been in mental health and substance abuse since 1986, and I can tell you honestly that only because of the results of what happened in Chicago since 07 is the reason that I'm standing up here to give you some information about what has happened in Chicago and what we're doing about it. Um, I remember back when I, start, I first started researching about suicide. Um, we had seven suicides in 18 months um, in 08 and 09, and then we had four and five months in 2010. So I got on the internet, like our kids do, to research suicides in the fire service, and you know what came up? The same number that came up when I typed in how much money I could get from the University of Illinois if my kid went there. <laughs> Uh, which was a big goose egg. Uh, there was nothing out there in the fire service. Thank goodness, recently, as we do these presentations, more and more people, more and more departments, people like Claire and, and Dr. Paul, there's, inf there's more information out there. And that's our goal is to try to give you, a, I'm going to give you a little bit of past history, a little bit of present history, which is going to compare with the national statistics because there are no known statistics out there in the fire service, zero, except for one. And that's the report that um, me and my staff did over a two year period. And it took us, uh, took us 10 months to review 1,787 death certificates, which most people wouldn't ever want to do. So if I could figure out how to do this. You can use the arrows on the computer, it's just easier. All right here? Yeah. All right. Okay, I got it, cool. All right, so one thing I, want, I wanted to know and what I'm gonna give to you is a brief history of the history and we're gonna go back a, a little bit. So what do we know about suicide? And back in, we hear about the stigma and stigma means a defect, something wrong. Back in the early days, uh, way before Christ, uh, the feeling surrounding suicide was surprisingly favorable. Egyptians dealing with unbearable physical or mental issues chose suicide. And the Romans, in the years before and after Christ uh, was born, they had trained technicians to assist with suicide. As time went on, and the church got involved, that after uh, we found um, our Judas suicide after the betrayal of Jesus, uh, Jewish leaders then attempted to try to control suicide by refusing uh, to allow burials in hollow ground. In the fourth century, St. Augustine denounces suicide, and for centuries the feeling of stigma, the defect surrounding suicide, is a negative one. Moving further, in the Middle Ages, survivors of the people who attempted suicide are treated badly, shunned, and looked down upon. You get to the 17th and 18th century and suicide is reevaluated. You, you go into 1983 and the Roman Catholic Church at that point reverses the canon law prohibiting proper burial rights. Now the federal government gets involved, finally, in 1999 and U.S. Surgeon General initiates a call to action to prevent suicide with AIM, Awareness, Intervention, and Methodology. And then the Department of Health and Human Services in 2001 develops the National Strategy and Suicide Prevention Goals and Objectives, which basically, uh, if you ever look at, uh, and I don't remember the name of it, but it's in Tennessee, they're probably one of the most organized uh, groups in suicide prevention in the 50 states. So what the Department of Health and Human Services basically said is each state decide how you're going to help try to prevent suicide in your state. I could tell you in Illinois, there's the Illinois Suicide Prevention Association. They finally, and this year, put together a plan that 
hopefully they're going to roll out statewide. But 2013 and 2001, due to math, that's 12 years. Um, it's just too slow. So to reiterate some of the national statistics, because as I said, we don't have any statistics to compare to in the fire service, other than ones that I'll show you in the next couple slides, you have to compare with the national, national statistics, which as Dr. Paul had mentioned for the, the past 20 years, 30 or 30,000 or more people a year have died in the US by suicide. In 2010, it reached one of its highest numbers, 38,364 people committed suicide. That's one every 14 minutes. And obviously you know from what he said, how many attempt suicide. In 2005, 370,000 people were treated for self-inflicted injury. That's one every 42 seconds. All you first responders, you know what's going on out there. We see it, we live it. The thing is, and, and I've said this at other presentations, is we, we talk about suicide in the fire service, it's happening. Again, like substance abuse for the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even the present age, until we could get some numbers, truly, can we support what, what we're saying in regards to suicides going up and, uh, we, we, uh, like I said, I'm in the Labor EAP committee and all six of us on the committee that head our EAPs across the country, everybody has experienced suicides, but we don't have true raw data on that stuff. Um, in 2010, that number of self-injury went up to 633,000, which is a 70% increase from 05. The incident rate, which is based per 100,000, as Dr. Paul had mentioned, has ranged between 10 and 12 for the past 20 years, and in 2012, it hit a rate of 12.4. 2007, suicide is recognized as a chronic epidemic in the US, which has an estimated cost of $48 billion a year for indirect, or for direct and indirect costs for suicide and attempted suicide. Now that's a staggering number, and I did have a slide on this, but again, we're cut for time, is if you look at diabetes and HIV and, and the money that's put into research for suicide, suicide gets the least amount of money for research. Uh, back in 2011, we went to Baltimore, and we had a doctor knock from Harvard that does research um, in uh, suicide. And I asked him, I said, why don't we have more information out there? And he said, basically, they don't have the funding for it, and they can't get the statistics for it. And why can't you get, get the statistics for it? Because no one's talking about it. And how do you get that information? Uh, let me back up a, a second. I'm giving you some information. One thing I forgot to ask everybody here in the room um, as I kind of started uh, in a... Uh, silly way, raise your hand if you've experienced a suicide in your fire department. And that's for you guys. Every presentation that I've done, I, and I didn't do it for every single one in the beginning, um, but I decided to ask that of the uh, people that attended, and it's usually about 80%. It's usually about 80%. So other notable statistics that are out there, 90% of suicidal patients most likely have a diagnosable, diagnosable mental health or substance abuse order. Now Dennis mentioned that I'm a substance abuse counselor, been one since 1991, and I can honestly tell you that up until REAP started doing a research on suicides, I probably did 2,000 alcohol and drug assessments off the department and on the department, and I never asked that individual if they were suicidal. But I can guarantee you from now on, that's one of the questions that I ask and one of the questions that my staff ask. And I have three new staff, and believe me, that was one of the hardest questions for them to feel comfortable asking another individual. So when we talk about what to do and we talk about, and if you went to earlier the, the behavioral health and wellness presentation, when you're asking a professional to ask a person if they have suicidal thoughts, that's a bit scary for them. Now you give it to a peer, and it's the old adage of when you're in the firehouse or anywhere 
and you say, how are you doing? How many people really are asking, how are you doing? And then someone starts telling you how you're doing, like, oh, man, I should have just said hi. <laughs> um, again, males are four times more likely to die than, than females. Females are two or three times more likely to attempt suicide. Method of choice, again, are men's, men as firearms and woman, woman poisoning. And the studies show an average of six people, I think it's six to ten, and I'm not sure exactly where they, they get that information. But the way I view it is, it truly mentally and physically affects six to ten people that surround that individual. On a fire service, you know it affects a lot more people in various different ways. And as I talk, as many of you probably do as well, if you, and I go back to one of the wakes, or actually funerals, I remember after the fact going up to someone and saying, hey, I didn't see you at so-and-so's funeral. And I'm not going to say the four-letter word, but he said, blank him, he's a coward. Um, we know we get that response that obviously affected him. It may, he may have his own issues himself, but it definitely affects more than six or 10 people in the fire service. So this is kind of like getting caught with your pants down. Tom Ryan's our president here and he knows that, we, uh, that I did this and I actually asked him first for his permission to look into this, um, but someone's got to do it. Someone's got to take the veil off and say, these are the numbers. And back in 08 and 09, like I said, we had seven suicides and two other attempts in an 18 month period. Prior to that, I only knew of one. And that was talked about for about two weeks and then no one really ever talked about it again. Uh, the demographics of this was all were males Six were between the age of 49 and 52, one was 38. What's significant about 49 and 52? I know a lot of people are coming on now that are almost 49 and 52, especially in our department. But the way, when I look at that number, I go, and again, the next uh, bullet point is five had between 20 and 30 years on a department. They're nearing retirement. When we get on a job, we looked obviously to get promoted, to go to fires and do our stuff, but as time goes on, we look at retirement. These guys are nearing that stage, and what would get them, what would make them make that decision to commit suicide? When Claire gets up here and talks about Dr. Joyner's uh, three characteristics, it may make some more sense. Uh, but that, and I'll tell you honestly, frustrates the hell out of me that a person will spend 20, 30 years in a career and then end their life. Um, four hung themselves, which is different than the national average. Two by gun and one, one jumped off a building. Two had medical issues. And you, again, as Claire talks about Dr. Joyner, you, they'll talk about um, like a helplessness if, if you're as we know, we can't run as fast. We can't uh, do this lift as much as we did 20 years ago. We certainly can eat as much, and I'll get to that in a minute too. Um, two, two had alcohol abuse and use, uh, one clinically depressed, one uh, marital issues, and one was the anniversary of, the, of his wife's death. Um, obviously, there's other things going on. One of the big jokes is, and I'm sure anybody that's in, in EAP, people will come up to me and say, well, who do you go talk to? Well, luckily my wife has a master's in child and family therapy, and she helps me out. Also, I have at my beck and call 50 different therapists I could call up, and I do call them up, believe me. Uh, four committed suicide at home. Two of the other three committed suicide in a hospital while undergoing psychiatric treatment. Now, why is that important? Psychiatric treatment. I spent my first six years out of college working in a private psychiatric hospital, um, uh, counseling adolescents and adults. And when you're suicidal in a hospital, you're checked every 15 minutes. Somebody walks in that room, 
and you basically have nothing except the cloth on your, the robe on you. They take everything away. So what does that tell me? What does that tell you? That person was determined to kill themselves. Absolutely. So review, uh, what we did is, um, you know, that, those were staggering numbers in itself. And when I couldn't find anything online, I told Tom, I said, listen, Tom, I think we ought to do some research. Unbeknownst to us, we had 1,787 death certificates we had to review, and a lot of them of the people we knew. So we did that uh, between, for the years 1990 and 2009, and we came up with uh, 37 suicides, which was an average of two a year. 19 were active members and 18 retired. One of the big things in our committee that we're talking about is retirement. People are actually living longer. It used to be when I came on, guys collected 11 uh, pension checks and that was it. Um, now they're living longer. We wanna keep these people alive, but things are happening in retirement as well. Youngest was 27, the oldest was 83, the average was 54, all were males, 16s were veterans. More and more members coming on the job now are going to be veterans. In Boston, you get 10 points to take that exam. We're gonna have a significant number of people coming on that job that have history. The incident rate per 100,000 over 20 years. Again, for the 20 year period was 10.9, CFD was 24.98. Is that significant? It, it appears to me but I brought this to a Northwestern statistician, and he said, well, you can't say that you're more significant than a national average. And I was actually kind of pissed, but I, I texted him back and I said, why is that? And basically, as it was already brought up, the makeup of the department is mainly white. It's not the same makeup of the national average. So I said, well, how can I compare it? He said, we well, gotta do another study. <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, right, another two year study. So I did. <laughs> I mean, I, I, two year, tw uh, yeah, 20 year study for two years. But we did for uh, 2010, 2011, and 2012. We had five suicides out of 239 deaths. Four were in 2010, one was in 2011, none were in 2012. We unfortunately, as writing this, had two in 2013, and then we had one that, I don't know if it was how well it was publicized, but um, tried to die by cop, which pulled out his wallet, named it at the police, and got 55 bullets shot at him, and, and 12 hit him, and he survived. Again, with all the attempts, how do people survive? This guy, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, so, it, it's basically the same. It, it's, if it's two a year, it, it comes out in the last three years, it's been the same as the last 20 years. And if you look at that report, I think the most we had in any one year was six, and some years there were zero, but on average it was two a year, which came out to 20, almost 25 per 100,000, which again, that's a number you take what you want from it. I think it's a lot. Why don't I just throw this in there because when I were doing the research, I figured, you know what, let's, we're, going, we're doing this for a long time. Let's see what else is killing our guys. You kind of already know that, you know, already know cancer is. But how is it significant to the national average? And if you look at heart disease, we had 705 die from heart disease. That's 40%. And if you look at, if I could find it, the national average, 29%. 2010 to 2012, that second little study that I did, it actually went up 4% to 44%. And the joke behind it, which actually is necessarily not a joke, is forks and knives, I always say forks and knives have killed more firemen than smoke. Uh, I think we're eating healthier in the fire service, but that's something that there's, I don't know if there are other statistics out there, but that's what's going on in our department. Oh, change of personnel. as a suit. 
suicide, well, everyone that we considered a suicide had <coughs> suicide down there. The state of Florida doesn't list the uh, cause of death. So there was a number of guys that retired in Florida that died out there, we didn't get that number. There was also a number that maybe two or three that put down as confidential or can't, can't, um, can't provide. And then there were probably two or three that um, were, am I talking loud enough? And there were, there were like two or three that um, had alcohol down there. Um, No, I left those out. So, and if you get in a discussion with a lot of people, with the coroner, with um, uh, life insurance, with department benefits, you know where I'm going with that? Okay. <laughs> It's kind of interesting you said getting away with it, but uh, uh, what you've uh, immediately focused on is all our statistics are, pro are, are without question uh, underestimates. You know, when there's a long, straight road in Tennessee highway where at 2 o'clock in, in the afternoon with perfect weather, uh, a 22-year-old male who is opiate addicted uh, dies in a single car accident and it's not listed as a suicide. You, so I think uh, clearly what Dan ran into and w one of the uh, huge bugaboos about death certificate re uh, research is that it is clear that it's an underestimate. There's no question about it. So, oh, by the way, uh, I don't know who your st that statistician was, but there are ways to compare the, the demographics of the Chicago firefighters with the corresponding dem national demographics, meaning male, white, and in that age group. So something could have been, at least on a crude level, uh, calculated. And uh, my understanding in that age group is it runs around uh, between 16 and 18 per 100,000. So 24, which you're suggesting is a low number per 100,000, in my mind, it's clearly uh, significant. Um, so I'll be talking about what to look for. Um, and there's a lot that you can look for that may inform you that someone is contemplating or in danger of committing suicide. Um, many years ago, I worked on a runaway hotline, and we would have in-service trainings for our staff, for the crisis counselors who were answering the phones. And we often did suicide prevention sort of refreshers. Uh, the number of suicide calls for the month after that training, after that refresher, always went up. And it was because people had a heightened sensitivity to listen out for it. So that's why we're going to review a lot of the risk factors and factors that are uh, correlated with suicide. Mood disorders is one of the risk factors, and we'll talk more about the uh, specific mood disorders in a few minutes. Uh, they would include depression, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, substance use disorders, and loss. And I think it's important to repeat this. Someone mentioned it earlier, not just death, of someone, but a loss may be a loss of a job, maybe a loss of a, a marriage or a relationship. It may also be loss of uh, their physical health, uh, retirement. Um, so think of loss in a sort of more global way. And a history of trauma. So this could be a personal trauma or professional trauma, especially for first responders. Um, I also want to consider throwing previous attempts of suicide under this as well. Those who have attempted are more likely to try to attempt again, and that typically will occur within a year of that first attempt. So that's something to, to keep in mind also. So these are some of the warning signs that people, uh, someone may be considering suicide, talking about death or suicide, and that may be subtle or not so subtle. 
Uh, research shows that 80% of those who attempted and committed suicide had told someone beforehand. I get a little nervous sharing that statistic because I think we have a tendency towards uh, guilt or self-blame if we've lost someone in our lives. So it doesn't mean that we should have caught it and we could have prevented it. But it's just something to think about and look, and look for. Uh, those who engage in risky behaviors that could involve substances, um, for some it may be engaging in um, uh, risky behaviors like uh, motorcycle riding or driving while intoxicated, things like that. Giving away possessions, um, someone who may be making preparations for family's welfare, which could involve insurance policies, buying a gun or having other lethal means or just making references to how things will be when they're gone. So Dr. Reagan already touched upon this, so I'll just mention it briefly again, about the demographic that is most likely to commit suicide mirrors fire surface population. Um, other risk factors associated with firefighting are the exposure to trauma, divorce rates, financial issues, and then also unresolved grief. And then we also have the use of alcohol among the fire culture um, and for some presence of firearm. So I know Dan mentioned me talking about Dr. Joyner's interpersonal psychological theory that's related to serious suicide risk. Um, according to him, there are three causes of serious suicidal behavior. One is capacity. That means trying or practicing makes it less scary um, an example would be having a past attempt, and that is why someone who's tried in the past may be more likely to try it again. Uh, the idea that the more pain you endure, the more tolerant you become of pain. So that would be related to someone with repeated injuries and also a history of abuse. And the development of fearlessness, repeatedly witnessing injury or pain or violence. The second is perceived burdensomeness. So this is when um, you consider yourself more of a burden to other people than anything else, that your very existence is actually painful. That could be due to a physical ailment um, that is a heavy burden on your family and your friends, or suffering from emotional problems, or even having financial conflicts. And then the third is thwarted belongingness. Uh, a sense that you don't belong and that you have no value to the system or the community or the family that you're part of. This can be exacerbated by things like divorce, retirement, termination from the job. And then there's an additional factor, desensitization. So that's becoming desensitized makes one more vulnerable to carrying out their plan of suicide and they may lose their fear of physical pain and physical injury and death. He also talks about two characterizations of suicide attempts. The genuine suicide attempts were often characterized by a desire to make others better off by leaving, versus the non-suicidal self-injury was often characterized by desires to express anger or punish the other person or people in their life. So I'm jumping back to something I mentioned before about risk factors and these co-occurring disorders. For people who have attempted suicide, they often suffer from these um, additional disorders, whether it be addiction and depression um, or anxiety, and I'll, I'll be more specific um, attending to the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So again, things to look for if someone is suffering from an addiction. Um, a lot of these bullets are referring more to alcohol than drug abuse, but it all pertains. Uh, sneaking drinks, gulping first drinks, uh, a real unwillingness and resistance to talking about their drinking with peers or family members. Um, if a person may actually feel guilty around their drinking. Um, if their behaviors are alcohol-centered, meaning it's always whatever they want to do, there's got to be the beer there. Um, they may also lose friends or relationships because their drinking has, or their drug use has taken priority in their life. They may exhibit aggressive behavior. Uh, with people who suffer from addiction, 
it seems that their anger escalates as their addiction worsens, and then this also isolates them from friends and family, which really allows the disease to grow uh, and sort of prosper in its own little place with uh, no, not too many people around them, um, having them feel the consequences of their behavior. Prolonged alcohol binges is another sign of addiction, and then using alcohol or drugs to take the edge off, um, and especially prior to social contact. I think there's a term actually that I'm hearing more among young people, which is pregame. Have you heard this about before they go out to the bars? Maybe this is a New York thing. Um, but they do a pregame, meaning that they're going to drink a lot at home. Um, it was sort of started because it's more affordable <laughs> to drink at home than to go to the bars in New York. Um, but there's a lot of drinking even before they're going out with their friends. So that's addiction. Here are some of the signs of depression. I do want to say that suicide is 30 times greater for those who suffer from depression. Um, they would, uh, I think Dr. Reagan and both Dan mentioned feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, having a bleak outlook on life, uh, loss of interest in daily activities. There can be a change in weight, uh, either weight loss or weight gain. Sleep changes also. Someone can suffer from insomnia or hypersomnia, meaning they're just sleeping a lot. They have really uh, no motivation to get up and face their day. Uh, they can feel irritable and restless, uh, lose energy, have self-loathing thoughts and feelings, uh, concentration problems. Again, these are some of the things that I would imagine you could see in your peers at the firehouse if they are um, struggling with depression. I do want to just make a side note. Uh, personally, I've experienced this uh, in my work that someone who suffers from depression, if they have considered suicide as a plan, they can actually present in a lighter way. Um, they can seem like more energized than they typically present in treatment. And it's because they have this plan, that they have this plan that is going to actually help them end their pain. So also, if someone is seemingly depressed and then one day seems a little more up than usual, that doesn't mean they're sort of out of the woods or that you shouldn't be concerned. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to run through this quickly just because of time, but some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Currently, there's four categories of symptoms. One is intrusion and re-experiencing, um, and this is when someone is experiencing intrusive thoughts. They may also suffer from nightmares. Uh, examples of avoidance, constriction would be isolation from friends and family, uh, an avoidance of all people and places and things that would remind them of the traumatic event. Uh, negative thoughts and mood. They may have uh, a lack of interest in people, activity, activities, and inability to really feel happy. And then hyperarousal or hypervigilance is when the person is in sort of a permanent state of alert. They're always anticipating something to happen. Uh, I have an example that always um, sort of hits me. I was working with someone uh, who was downtown at the time of uh, the plane attacks and the collapses uh, on 9-11. And I worked with him for about eight years. Um, and it was the fifth anniversary. And I, he made a comment that surprised me. He was making a comment about the fashion trend he was noticing in Soho, where our, my office was, that the women were wearing flip-flops. And he said, I'm, I'm not sure why all these women are wearing flip-flops. And I thought that was kind of bizarre. So I asked, well, what does that matter to you? And he said, well, what are they going to do when they have to run? So he wasn't noted, noticing anything about the fashion, but he was noticing that they weren't ready. And why wouldn't they be ready, even though it was five years since anything had happened? So that's an example of the hyperarousal. I think you're up now. Dan? A little dance routine up here, too. All right. All right, quick question, um, class participation. Uh, how many in here are EAPs? I know I got a couple guys in the committee already, so we got about uh, four in here. How many are actually uh, peer support? Anybody here peer support? Okay, very good. Um, 
The reason I ask is because we give you the history, we talk about the signs and symptoms, and my, my what was kind of neat, I never met Claire before. This is, we um, connected through the internet, emails, put our slides together, and they're basically the same. Now, that was good. I mean, it actually supports what we're, the research that we're doing. On the other hand, what I think of is that with all this information, and, and I'm gonna tell you all the things that we're doing in Chicago, and I'm sure whatever we're doing in Chicago, we only have five staff, and Claire and her counseling center have 100. They're doing it a lot more than we are. Suicides are still happening. The frustrating part is that with all the signs and symptoms, every single survivor, husband, wife, or whatever that I've talked to said they had no signs or symptoms. Didn't know that that person was gonna kill himself. All the same. You know, there was only one common denominator and it goes back to drinking. And remember one woman saying he was a heavy, active alcoholic. And I just have to reiterate that because I look back at my history and all the assessments that I did and all the times that I didn't ask about suicide, it, it, you gotta know, like when I asked other psychologists, I sat down with six of them and I asked them about suicide, only one had experience with it. So I couldn't get information from them. You have to go out and search this, the, the, the specific people out there to get that information. So when we talk about now, what do we do? What can we do to potentially prevent this? One of the things hopefully that all of you will take back and one of the things that this morning's group, the Behavioral Health and Wellness, is really touching on is not responding after an incident, it's responding before an incident. Every day there's an incident. Every day in a firehouse there's somebody's kid that's sick, gets hurt, somebody dies, um, you're going bankrupt, um, you, you lost all your money, you're late for work, there's all kinds of things that go on. Um, so how do we address that? And what we're suggesting is, and what we do, and what we're gonna start doing, and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, is um, a gatekeeper program. But peer-to-peer -peer is that all of you that are here at this class, hopefully will pass on to the people back home is that if you ask a person if they're suicidal, that's not gonna make them think about it. They're not, that's not gonna make them do that. But you have to be okay with asking that direct question. Now, do you ask it at roll call? No. <laughs> do you ask it at the kitchen table? No. You ask it in private. Um, if your co colleague admits it then, just kind of like what I mentioned in regards to how you doing, and they actually confide in you, what do you do with that? And there's a number of things that you can do. Um, obviously, express your concern to an appropriate person. Um, that could be the barn boss in a house that is a person that uh, you look up to and has been there for years and, and, and you, go, you go to for problem solving uh, and then you trust and it is not gonna telephone, telegraph, tell another fireman. Um, you can talk to the supervisor. You, you also have the option of giving them, a, a, you know, an 800 number, the uh, crisis hotline, 800-273-TALK. Um, offer to help your colleague find or accompany him or her to a mental health professional. That's about resources. One of the big things in regards to EAP work is I can't do everything. I'm not a specialist in everything. The reason I'm up here is because the statistics that I showed you. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be up here. And I'm not saying I'm a, I'm, I'm not a specialist in this. I was forced to look into this information. But you have to have good and reasonable resources to refer to. And if you're a peer, one of those re referrals could be to the EAP or the, the counseling center or to a therapist that they might have gone to themselves. Um, but it should be area specific. Um, 
Call 911. What do we respond on? Psychiatric emergency, right? I mean, we all say in the firehouse, that guy's nuts. We, we, come on, Tommy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we do have some people that are unstable. And rather than just point the finger, uh, well, I'm not saying that. If somebody goes haywire at, at, uh, at the firehouse, there have been some fires at the firehouses throughout the country, have there? You have to put out your own firehouse? <laughs> not in Chicago, at least. Um, what's that? Oh, it was in Chicago. That's right. Uh, we can't talk about that. Um, so there are resources. There are options. If you're a peer and you do get confided in and someone gives you some information, um, I had an example uh, last night. Got a call from an officer who heard from another officer that at a scene, one of the firefighters uh, said, I'm going to kill myself. And this officer called me up last night and was shaken and stirred, not drunk, just shaken about the fact that this person said it. And we did some presentations in Chicago to talk about what a peer should do. What do you do? Do you keep your mouth shut and let that person, what if they kill themselves the next day? So 99% of our contact with people is voluntary. 98, 97. In a life threatening situation, my office will make the phone call. So after talking to the individual who, that calls me, he's my client, I talk to them, actually get the number of the individual and I tell them that I'll give that, give that person a call. Takes the stress off the individual and now we push it up to a professional, do the assessment, come to find out for us, I was glad to hear that um, it wasn't warranted. It was, um, she denied it and uh, she basically said that she was fine, which was good. But to have options. So in Chicago, we've done a number of things and this is basically a list of stuff that we've done. And one thing, obviously by the statistics, is let's not keep that secret, that 800 pound gorilla that used to be substance abuse, quiet. And let's talk about it and that's why we're here to discuss it. Open communication in home, at, at home and at work. I have a 28 year battalion chief, 28 year, no, yeah, 28 years on the job as a battalion chief. L recently I've been talking to him and it was as a result of an incident that, they, that he experienced that the department didn't respond to in a critical incident where a man set his wife and kid on fire and there was no critical incident response to that incident. We talked for months and months and months. I basically discussed things and he went on to say how he's been married for 29 years and basically getting divorced for 29 years. And I said, well, you, you know what's going on with us. The same thing that went on with me is that we have a tendency to bring our stuff home. We don't talk about it, but it comes out in a behavior. Either a sharp response, a go F yourself, I'm leaving, I'll be back in 20 minutes and that's two days later, whatever, it comes out in a behavior. And I said, a simple thing, open that line of communication with your wife, engage her, and just say, hey, you know what, I had a tough day today, and see where it goes. And sure as I'm standing here, the individual about a week later said, you know, I tried what you said, and you know what, it worked. It's the simplest thing. In 27 years of counseling, it's connecting with that individual and that'll take you a long way. Education, it's not a one-time situation. What we do is we put out articles in a sounder. You heard uh, Frank Lito talk about it. We put them out quarterly. We do the research and we put them out um, also on our website. Leadership by respected peers, which is peer support, which everybody hopefully has. And the big thing with that is that you have to have people that are number one, going to be confidential in most cases. Obviously, in the case of suicide, you can't keep that confidential. What we're trying to do in Chicago, and I just got this off the ground as a result of this, in, this battalion chief that I've been talking to, is a gatekeeper program, which kind of goes along with this morning's presentation and um, QRP, or QPR, question, persuade, and respond, which is 
the government's approach to suicide. Um, question the person, persuade them to get help, and give them a referral. So what we're trying to do in Chicago is get 50 to 75 people that would be willing to be trained in a 40-hour class and be out there and be recognized on a daily basis. Because I know one of the questions that I ask people when they call me, I said, how long have you been thinking about calling me? And they tell me, I picked up the phone a dozen times and it's been going on for you know, six months, me, me wanting to call. The behavior's been going on for six or 16 years. So if we get the people out in the firehouses, they're more apt to use it. It's the psychology behind if there's candy right here and it's unwrapped, I'm gonna get it. If it's the end of the room, I'm not gonna walk all, all the way over there and get it. And I know I'm running out of time, um, two minutes. Okay, assessments are the key. Like I said, I've been doing alcohol and drug assessments from 1991 and I never addressed the question of suicide. You have to have, that, that, that is the key. And I'm not talking about necessarily peers, this is more sense about EAPs in general is that you gotta be able to do that assessment. I've been doing this for a while and I'm still learning. I am not the best assessor. You have to know your limitations. You have to know your resources that you refer to and that takes some time. Counselors have to ask those hard questions. Um, one thing that we did, and so did the Chicago police after they had 16 suicides in one year, uh, they did roll calls. They're, they took their EAP and their peer support out to roll calls. What we did is we took two years and went out to every single firehouse on every shift. All we want to do is introduce ourselves, tell them how to access us, and let, us, let them know that we're there. Sometimes the conversation was 10 minutes, sometimes it was an hour, and 90% of the time when we walked out to our car, guess what? Someone walked out to the car with us and asked us something else. Uh, Department of Education, we created a family focus day as a result of those suicides. We create a venue for five hours at our Quinn Fire Academy where we have two presentations, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, kind of like the behavioral health and wellness and the suicide prevention. We get 40 resources from around the area, individual therapists, treatment centers, chiropractors, naturopaths, financial institutions. Let people come there, we feed them, we have door prizes. And in the last four years, this is our fifth year, every year we've had 500 to 800 people show up. And that doesn't just, we're not talking just members, we're talking about their spouse and their children. It's about exposure and being out there. Last thing is, and. I'm not gonna get into it other than the fact that this morning if you went to the Behavioral Health and Wellness, if your fire department does not have an organized and continuing education behavioral health and wellness program, you're behind the curve. Thanks. Thank you very much, and that does leave us with some time for questions. Uh, so I'll open it up to the group. Uh, please, if you have a question, speak loud enough so we can hear it. I'll repeat it, uh, and give us your name and where you're from, too. Yes, sir. you all hear the question? Is it possible that suicides actually run in a family? I'll just leave that to the panel. Um, absolutely. Uh, and uh, the explanation for that appears to be two separate things. One is we think that there's a genetic predisposition uh, that can run in families. Uh, one of uh, the best uh, known uh, medical facts about suicide is in their cerebral spinal fluid of suicide victims, violent, uh, 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 kill themselves violently, uh, the serotonin metabolite uh, is low. And that study has been done over and over and over again, and it's one of the most consistent, robust findings. The second thing, and it's something that 
uh, uh, Claire referred to is it's similar to how alcohol runs in families. If you, uh, is there, there's a learning model. And so one of the questions to ask uh, when we're doing an assessment is, uh, has anyone in your family or do you know anyone who's ever committed suicide? And when a friend or a family member have committed suicide, that seems to lower the threshold and sort of almost gives an example. So we think it's both from learning theory and from genetics that it can run in families. Yes. Any other comments? You're good. Next question. Any questions? Yes, sir. Right here. Paul Andrews, Hillsborough County, Kevin Florida. Uh, just started our kind of peer program in our department due to our recent suicide the last couple of years. The issue we have, the water gate issue, or I think we have, it's ran through our health insurance company, so we'll just talk about it respectfully there, but you only get five to six a year is all that you get. Um, so we've been trying to find out are there grants or are there, are there models to help, um, to help us fund this? Because I know mental health just in general and the way it's underfunded, you know, arm in our society as it is, you know, it's just frustrating to want to help. But, you know. So the question is, are there grants or other resources available to help fund this uh, type of treatment? Um, I can tell you about uh, the New York City Fire Department Counseling Unit, which we're very lucky is supported by the department. So uh, we're a very atypical employee assistance program because we can provide services directly. Um, and then there are members who would rather go uh, outside of the department and then they access their insurance for any mental health services. Um, so I, I don't know if when you say your EAP is limited to five sessions and then after that it would be tapping into your health insurance? I believe it's out of your pocket the whole cost. Really? Okay. Um, the only thing I can think about is, you know, to try to talk to your department, your administration to see if there's any support there for some in-house. Um, but I also know being a clinician that there is a great desire for mental health professionals to help first responders. Um, and I know within my own community, uh, a lot of therapists are willing to work pro bono or at the very least on a sliding scale to make it affordable, um, you know, to give back to a community that gives to, to us. So you might also want to check on local mental health professional organizations, institutions, uh, even universities for that. I, I would just like to add that uh, uh, for uh, uh, medical insurance, in the, in the United States, your medical insurance and your behavioral health insurance are separate. So if you pull out your card and you know what your medical insurance is, you don't necessarily know what your behavioral health. But as a group, uh, the, the behavioral health uh, insurance needs to be re renegotiated. That's pretty medieval, and, and, and uh, I've had pretty wide experience and half the patients we get at a New Life Lodge are from out of state. And I haven't run into anything that restrictive in a long, long time. And, the, and even if you have any legal advice, there's a Health Care Parity Act that says for substance abuse and mental health, the coverage has to be on par or have parity with the medical coverage. So it's now increasingly not uh, uh, allowed. Uh, so if they if they give lots more visits for asthma or diabetes, but restrict that, they may be in violation. But that's a contract that just, in my opinion, yeah, yeah, needs to be renegotiated. I mean, that's. Dan, did you have anything to add? Yeah, well, is this working? Okay. One, one thing you can do uh, pre-incident is you could potentially partner with treatment centers or organizations that are out there that would love to have your business. Talk to them and cultivate a relationship, and they may do some training for you. Uh, one thing that we did in our contract is about seven years ago, we got kind of a grant from the city $50,000, and we earmarked it to three different organizations, one a primary treatment center and one a uh, halfway house 
so that if the insurance cut off the individual, then we'd still have some money at that facility. Um, to, you know, if they only got seven to 10 days and we wanted to get them 14 to 21, we had some funds out there. What's happened after 11 years of doing that, actually it's 13, the last two years, that, organ, that, that treatment center matched our grant, which was $30,000, and they, they matched 30, so we got 60 out there. So what happens too is a lot of times is you get a kid that's, or, a, or a, a member who has a son or daughter that's 27 or 28, doesn't have insurance, doesn't have a job, has no place to go, now at least you get some treatment there. Another question. If not, I would like to ask the panelists each one at a time as we wrap this up today, uh, if, if they would just provide their insight as to regarding this, this issue of suicide in the fire service. Uh, if, you could only, if you could leave the group with one piece of information or one piece of advice today about this issue, what, what would it be if it could only be one? And Dan, I'll start with you. I won't belabor it, but uh, it, this may be a far fetch in a sense of, a, of the commercial where you had the, the, the picture of a person and if you tell one friend and you tell one friend and the next, instead of four people, it's eight and then eight, 16. Uh, I basically said that over the last five years in talking to peers, EAPs and fire chiefs across the country, it's systemic in regards to suicide. Now suicide is a permanent action for something that's been going on for a while. And if we get into the depression, PTSD, PTSD I think is one of the most undiagnosed diagnoses out there, especially on the fire service. So how do we get that addressed in the fire service so we don't get to that suicide? And that's through continuing education. Um, something that we didn't get to, but I wanted to just leave a quick message about, which is um, although we've talked about suicide prevention, there are still people who will continue to follow through and end their lives. And that, um, that doesn't mean that you did something wrong. Um, but it leaves us with a lot of different feelings and uh, leaves us to have to look out for ourselves as well as survivors. Uh, so just to take care of yourself, not sit alone with it, um, because talking with other people who experience a similar, similar loss have a lot to offer uh, in terms of healing. Doc? I think that uh, as a professional group, the most important thing at this stage uh, of understanding about suicide is that you ask yourself and you really come to terms with understanding what your emotional response is to this topic and get that under some type of control. Uh, this is an, a medical, psychological uh, issue. You saw the statistics. It's out there whether you like it or not. Uh, it's like when the sun comes up or goes down, it's not anything we can change uh, if we don't uh, pay attention to it. But if we m moralize, if we judge, if we're judgmental, if we think it's a sin, those sorts of things, then it's going to stay underground. Um, and one of the things in the intensive care units that I would get on my, the young doctors and medical students about is when you go in there, don't say to the person, you know, were you trying to commit suicide? You know, there's lots of religion in the South. That's like asking someone, are you a sinner? If you, have I ever sinned? Yeah, probably, I'm human. But if you ask me, if, am I a sinner, I'm going to say no. Uh, so if you get your own emotional response under control, then you can do the kinds of things that uh, uh, Dan and Claire have, have talked about, which is uh, we ask somebody in private, how you doing? and you know they're drinking, and you know they're struggling, you know things aren't going well at home, you know a bunch of different things, and then you say, and how are you really doing? And uh, you, you may well save somebody's life. 
Well, on behalf of the panel and myself, I'd like to take just a second and thank you all for being here this afternoon. The fact that you're here today is an indication of how, how significant this issue is, I think, for us. Uh, you saw the statistics. I can tell you the two fire, the fire departments I've been with as a firefighter, I would run out of fingers, thumbs, and some toes counting the number of suicides we've had in those two departments during my career. It is significant, and you know, thank God we're talking about it more than we ever have before. Uh, I mentioned the evaluations to you. They're really serious about those, so please fill them out. They never did bring the code. So please write suicide prevention on the top of that so they know which class we're talking about. Before you leave, please help me thank the panelists. 